Fifth voyage. <clears throat> Not even all that I had gone through could make me contented with a quiet life. I soon wearied of its pleasures and longed for adventure and change. Therefore, I set out once more, but this time in a ship of my own, which I built and fitted out at the nearest seaport. I wished to be able to call at whatever port I chose, taking my own time. But as I did not intend carrying enough goods for a full cargo, I invited several merchants of different nations to join me. We set sail with the first favourable wind, and after a long voyage upon the open seas, we landed upon an unknown island, which proved to be uninhabited. We determined, however, to explore it, but had not gone far when we found a rock's egg, as large as the one I had seen before, and evidently nearly hatched, for the beak of the young bird had already pierced the shell. In spite of all I could say to deter them, the merchants who were with me fell upon it with their hatchets, breaking the shell and killing the young rock. Then, lighting a fire upon the ground, they hacked morsels from the bird and be proceeded to roast at them, roast them, while I stood by aghast. Scarcely had they finished their ill-omened repast when the air above us was darkened by two mighty shadows. The captain of my ship, knowing by experience what this meant, cried out to us that the parent birds were coming and urged us to get on board with all speed. This we did, and the sails were hoisted, but before we had made any way, the rocks reached their despoiled nest and hovered about it, uttering frightful cries when they discovered the mangled, remain mangled remains of their young one. For a moment we lost sight of them and were flattering ourselves that we had escaped, when they reappeared and soared into the air directly over our vessel. We saw that it each hand, yeah, we saw that each held in its claws an immense rock ready to crush us. There was a moment of breathless suspense, then one bell, bird loosed its hold and the huge block of stone hurtled through the air. But thanks to the presence of mind of the helmsman, who turned our ship violently in another direction, it fell into the sea close beside us, cleaving it asunder till we could nearly see the bottom. We had hardly time to draw a breath of relief before the other rock fell with a mighty crash right in the midst of our luckless vessel, smashing it into a thousand fragments and crushing or hurling into the sea passengers and crew. I myself went down with the rest, but had the good fortune to rise unhurt, and, by holding on to a piece of driftwood with one hand and swimming with the other, I kept myself afloat and was presently washed up by the tide onto an island. Its shores were steep and rocky, but I scrambled up safely and threw myself down to rest upon the green turf. When I had somewhat recovered, I began to examine the spot in which I found myself, and truly it seemed to me I had reached a garden of delights. There were trees everywhere, laden with flowers and fruit, while a crystal stream wandered in and out under their shadow. When night came, I slept sweetly in a cosy nook, though the remembrance that I was alone in a strange land made me sometimes start up and look around me in alarm, and then heartily wish I had stayed at home. However, the morning sunlight restored my courage, and I once more wandered amongst the trees, but always with some anxiety as to what I might see next. I had penetrated some distance into the island when I saw an old man, bent and feeble, sitting upon the river bank. At first I took him to be some shipwrecked mariner like myself. Going up to him, I greeted him in a friendly way, but he only nodded his head at me in reply. I then asked what he did there, and he made some signs to me that he wished to get across the river to ga gather some fruit, and seemed to beg me to carry him on my back. Pitying his age and feebleness, I took him up, and wading across the stream, I bent down that he might more easily reach the bank, and bade him get down. But instead of allowing himself to be set upon his feet, even now it makes me laugh to think of it, this creature, who had seemed to me so decrepit, leapt nimbly upon my shoulders, and hooking his legs around my neck gripped me so tightly that I was well nigh choked, and so overcome with terror that I fell insensible to the ground. When I recovered, my enemy was still in his place, though he had released his hold enough to allow me breathing space. And seeing me revive, he prodded me adroitly first with one foot and then with the other, until I was forced to get up and stagger about with him under the trees while he gathered and ate the choicest fruits. <coughs> 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 
This went on all day and even at night, and when I threw myself down half dead with weariness, the terrible old man held on tight to my neck, nor did he fail to greet the first glimmer of morning light by drumming upon me with his heels, until I perforce woke, awoke and resumed my dreary march with rage and bitterness in my heart. <coughs> It happened one day that I passed under a tree, under which lay several dry gourds. Catching one up, I amused myself with scooping out its contents and pressing it into the juice of several bunches of the grapes which hung from every vine. When it was full, I left it propped in the fork of a tree, and a few days later, carrying the hateful old man that way, I snatched up my gourd as I passed it, and had the satisfaction of a draught of what excellent wine, so good and refreshing, that I even forgot my detestable burden and began to sing and caper. The old monster was not slow to perceive the effect that my draught had produced, and that I carried him more lightly than usual. So he stretched out his skinny hand, and, seizing the gourd, first tasted its contents cautiously, then drained them to the last drop. The wine was strong, and the gourd capacious, and so he also began to sing after a fashion. Soon I had the delight of feeling the iron grip of his goblin's leg, goblin legs unclasp, and with one vigorous effort I threw him to the ground, from which he did not move again. I was so rejoiced to have last got rid of this uncanny old man that I ran leaping and bounding down to the seashore where, with the greatest good luck, I met with some mariners who had anchored off the island to enjoy the gel delicious fruits and to renew their supply of water. They heard the story of my escape with amazement, saying, You fell into the hands of the old man of the sea, and it is a mercy he did not strangle you as he has done everyone else whose shoulders he has managed to perch himself. This island is well known as the scene of his evil deeds, and no merchant or sailor who lands on it cares to stay far away from his conmos. After we had all talked for a while, they took me back with them on board their ship, where the captain received me kindly. We soon set sail, and after several days reached a large and prosperous-looking town where all of the houses were built of stone. Here we anchored, and one of the merchants, who had been very friendly to me on the way, took me ashore with him and showed me a lodging set apart for strange merchants. He then provided me with a large sack and pointed out to me a party of others equipped in like manner. Go with them, said he, and do as they do, but beware of losing sight of them for if you strayed, your life may well be in danger. With that, he supplied me with provisions, bade me farewell, and I set out with my new companions. I soon learned that the object of our expedition was to fill our sacks with coconuts, but when at length, length I saw the trees and noted their immense height and the slippery smoothness of their slender trunks, I did not understand at all how we were supposed to do it. The crowns of the cocoa palms were alive with monkeys, big and little, which skipped from one to the other with surprising agility, seeming to be curious about us and disturbed at our appearance. I was at first surprised when my companions, after collecting stones, began to throw them at the lively creatures, which seemed to me quite harmless. But very soon I saw the reason of it and joined them heartily, for the monkeys, annoyed and wishing to pay us back in our own coin, began to tear the nuts from the trees and cast them at us with angry and spiteful gestures. So after very little labour, our sacks were filled with the fruit which we would not have otherwise obtained. As soon as we had as many coconuts as we could carry, we went back to the town, where my friend bought my share and advised me to continue the same occupation until I had earned enough money to carry me to my own country. This I did, and before long had amassed a considerable sum. Just then, I heard that there was a trading ship nearby, ready to sail. Taking leave of my friend, I went on board, carrying with me a goodly store of coconuts, and we sailed first to the islands where pepper grows, then to Kamari, where the best aloes wood is found, and where men drink no wine by an unalterable law. Here I exchanged my nuts for pepper and good aloes wood, and went fishing for pearls with some of the other merchants and my divers were so lucky that very soon I had an immense number, and those very large and perfect. With all these treasures I came joyfully back to Baghdad, where I disposed of them for large sums of money, of which I did not fail, as before, to give the tenth part to the poor, and after that I rested from my labours and comforted myself with all the pleasures that my riches could give me. 
Having thus ended his story, Sinbad ordered that one hundred sequins be given to Hindbad, and then and the guests then withdrew. But after the next day's feast, he began the account of his sixth voyage as follows.